Good afternoon. My name is Adam Silvera, and I'm the administrative judge of this magnificent building, courthouse. And I'm honored to welcome you to this afternoon's program as we pay tribute and honor our county clerk, and Commissioner of Jurors, Norman Goodman, who served with distinction and, tire and tirelessly for the courts for 45 years in this role. Um, and, th and I'd like to welcome those of you tuning in in our hybrid program, but you really can't get the, you really have to come and visit us to see the beautiful artwork and this magnificent uh, courthouse building. Um, uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge a number of our uh, distinguished guests. We have with us the former chief judge of the state of New York, the Honorable Jonathan Littman. We have our former Chief Clerk Emeritus, uh, the Honorable John Warner. She likes to hide in the middle, but she's the former administrative judge of this building, and I've learned so much from her um, throughout the years, and a former statewide uh, jurist, uh, uh, coordinating judge on matrimonial affairs, the Honorable Jack, Jackie Silberman. I'd like to acknowledge our chief clerk, Dennis Rayo, and his fabulous team that has put this uh, program together. Naomi, Michelle, Ahmad, and everybody, thank you. And deputy chief clerk, and our Deputy Chief Clerk, Peter Sorrento. I also would like to recognize our never-ending, tireless, hardworking Chief of Staff to the Deputy Chief Administrative Judge, Deborah Kaplan, uh, Linda Dunlop-Miller. We have special counsel to the Deputy Chief Administrative Judge Kaplan, Joan Levinson. And I'd like to thank all of, we have, I cannot forget my sister, across the street, the surrogate Hillary Gingold. And many, many of my colleagues from uh, Supreme Civil Branch, too many for me to list individually, but we note your appearance and thank you. Okay. Um, so, as I said, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Supreme Court Civil Branch of New York to welcome you today um, to the, our magnificent rotunda as we have a round table of distinguished professors who will give us the historical background and perspective of the history of this, this beautiful artwork. Um, and I really hope, as I mentioned earlier, that those tuning in on the live stream really take an opportunity to visit this beautiful courthouse, to see our fabulous rotunda, and really see for yourself how wonderful and blessed and privileged and honored and a pleasure that I get to come to work in this building every day. Um, we're also so delighted to partner up with the Historical Society today in the presentation and we thank Professors Ritter, Berman, and Harrison for being here today and providing the historical significance behind these murals. And this event today is exactly what our current Chief Judge, our outstanding Chief Judge, the Honorable Rowan D. Wilson, who has made it a mission that our courts embrace our civics, that we should know something about the history, you should know something about other than, yeah, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful painting mural above, that we should know something about our courthouse and how we become who we are today. So on behalf of, chief, our, of our Chief Judge Wilson and the entire executive team of OCA, I welcome you today. And I wish you a wonderful program. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce 
our acting executive director, Allison Mori from the Historical Society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Silvera, for your kind remarks. And thank you to Patrick for his wonderful bagpipe performance as we entered this historic rotunda. And thank you all for joining us, whether you're here in this beautiful space or tuning in virtually, we appreciate your support. My name is Allison Mori, and I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Historical Society of the New York Courts. The Society is a 501c3 nonprofit charged with the mission of protecting and promoting the rich legal history of the state. We accomplish this in several ways. We empower students to be better citizens and create change through our educational initiatives. We capture living history in our oral history project. We share the unique legal history stories of the state in our publications, and we develop programs such as this one that showcase how the past informs the present, not only in the legal profession, but also in society as a whole. We're thrilled to be returning to 60 Center Street to partner with our friends and colleagues here for New York County Courthouse WPA murals. Who created them and what do they represent? Today's program will feature presentations and conversation about the evolution of courthouse art during the New Deal era and the Works Progress Administration murals in New York City and of course in the courthouse. And if there's one name that's become synonymous with the preservation of these murals, it's Norman Goodman, the namesake of this lecture. The long-serving New York County clerk championed the treasures of the courthouse, both its art and historical records. And so before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to recognize Norman's storied career and passion projects with remarks delivered by someone who served with Norman for decades. Indeed, this person spent more than half a century in this very courthouse for his own storied career and more recently served as chief clerk and executive officer before retiring in 2019. John F. Werner. Please join me in welcoming John to the podium. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Judge Lippman, uh, Judge Silvera, Judge Silverman. Uh, so wonderful to be here. Uh, and thank you, Judge Silvera, for introducing so many. So I, I, I can move on and uh, uh, speak uh, about Norman. Uh, and uh, uh, Norman had uh, two rules when it came to programs such as this. Uh, everyone should have fun and everyone should enjoy themselves. And rule two, if you're not having fun and you're not enjoying yourself, you should at least try your best to look as though you were enjoying yourself. But the history of these murals in this courthouse, uh, not so well known, quite frankly, and uh, it need be better known. And uh, the His Historical Society is such an important resource for spreading the word about uh, the history and traditions of, of, our, of our great courts. As you know, and as has been said, I, I retired from this courthouse in August of 2019. Uh, tempest fugit, time flies, and, and it seems only yesterday. Uh, many here today knew Norman well, worked with him, but some did not know him well, some never met him. So it's certainly fitting at this lecture, this Norman Good <coughs> Goodman lecture, that we feature some of Norman's wonderful work here in the court uh, his remarkable uh, years of service. A few words about uh, Norman's family. Uh, Penny Goodman, uh, who I very much admired, was a uh, totally independent and forceful woman. Uh, she had an important career of her own in the New York City school system, a career teacher, and uh, what Penny thought is what she said, uh, perhaps without much filter. Always very refreshing and uh, uh, always interesting. Uh, I know this date dates me, but uh, for whatever reason, 
uh, Leslie Gore's uh, what became a fem feminist anthem, You Don't Omen, Owe Me, comes to mind when I think of Penny. Uh, and uh, uh, Penny was so supportive of Norman always, and uh, I so much enjoyed her company. Uh, Susan Goodman, uh, Penny and uh, Norman's daughter, is here with us today. Uh, Su Susan's an accomplished writer and editor and uh, a good friend. Uh, Susan has a sister, Nan Goodman, uh, who is here on streaming, by streaming. And Nan, Nan is an academic uh, in the English department at the University of Colorado Boulder. Very accomplished. And before Nan undertook her academic, her career in academics, she followed perhaps a more pedestrian course as far as some of us are concerned. She, she went to law school and she was admitted to the New York State Bar. Uh, Norman's grandchildren, S Sam and Q, Jacqueline, always Q, uh, are also viewing online. Uh, Norman would want me to mention uh, his chief first deputy county clerk, uh, Jim Rossetti, who is here with us today. Uh, Jim served this court with great distinction, and uh, it was always a great pleasure for me uh, to work with Jim on any project. As was mentioned, Norman was devoted to this courthouse, devoted without reservation. Uh, he was counter clerk for 45 years. Uh, he loved the courthouse. He loved the artwork. And he did his best to preserve both and conserve both. In the late, in the early 1980s, Norman undertook a project in our jury assembly room, now the Norman Goodman jury assembly room. And by the way, whenever I would mention to Norman the jury assembly room, Norman would correct me gently and say, John, it's the Norman Goodman jury assembly room. <laughs> and so it was, so it is, and so it will remain. But this project he undertook in the jury assembly room involved that section which depicts murals, the murals depict the city, New York City, in the 1920s and 30s. And that section, for whatever reason, had been put aside as the smoking section of the jury assembly room. Can you imagine that? And over decades, smoke and tar had, had dulled the murals, stained the murals, and Norman, somehow or other, was able to recruit art, art conservators from SUNY Antianta, which is near Cooperstown, to spend a summer cleaning those murals. And that effort was just a great success, and, and those are just wonderful murals. What happened to the original Tiffany or Tiffany style light fixtures that were in the jury assembly room when uh, this courthouse opened in 1927? I don't know. And what happened to similar fixtures which were in all of our courtrooms when this courthouse opened? I don't know. That's another sad story, but it does bespeak the need to be careful and preserve uh, the uh, magnificence of, of, of these uh, wonderful courthouses. Norman was very much involved with the conservation and the restoration of the Rotunda Mural. The Rotunda Mural uh, was, as we heard and as many of us know, a part of the the, the Work Project Administration's effort to bring art to public buildings. Throughout this building, so many other courthouses, 
post offices, libraries, uh, a wonderful f f success uh, during the Great Depression, employed a vast number of artists, and uh, was so successful. And Atelier Pustelaire was the principal muralist in charge of the project. He was in his mid-70s when this was done, and you can imagine him up on scaffoldings in this rotunda uh, painting this magnificent mural. Unfortunately, uh, water had infiltrated and uh, damaged a good deal of the murals by the mid-1980s. And Norman organized a project to raise private funds uh, for the restoration of this mural and worked very closely with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to uh, restore this mural and murals throughout the courthouse. Uh, the degradation that had occurred was essentially water seepage causing flaking, so there were there were la large swaths of bare plaster showing. Uh, Connie Silver was the conservator at the time, did a wonderful job conserving this mural, and uh, when she was done, everyone was so thrilled. We see now, however, uh, some, some further damage uh, to the mural from leaks over in this corner, uh, the pilgrim sec section, uh, and uh, vigilance is required, and Norman would certainly want us to do everything we could to uh, maintain uh, these beautiful murals. On the even evening of April 7th, 2008, the Historical Society held a gala honoring Norman, his devotion to the history of this court, and his devotion to the New York State court system. It was a great, memorable event, and everyone so appreciated it. On December 14th, uh, 2000, excuse me, on December 10th, 2014, in this rotunda, the Historical Society had a significant presence at Norman's retirement party. Uh, Jonathan Lippman, Judge Lippman spoke, Chief Judge Kay spoke, all wonderful tributes to Norman upon his retirement. The Historical Society also maintains a wonderful collection of oral histories of uh, bar leaders uh, and uh, court leaders. And uh, Norman gave his own oral history in 2009. And that oral history is available online for anyone who may be interested on the Historical Society's website. As I say, uh, those who work in this building, those who are here day in and day out, and those who are just passing through often do not know a great deal about the history of the building or the history of, of, of these murals. And we're hoping uh, that is about to change. Uh, and uh, this program is part of that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, my good friend and former colleague and former uh, deputy chief clerk of this court, Robert Mead, who is here with us today, is in the midst of finishing an article uh, about the history of uh, these WPA murals. Uh, when that is published and posted on the Historical Society's website, I think it will provide a great deal of information an insight into uh, the artistry and history of these important works. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Ritter, um, Professor uh, Berman, and Helen has, have all read Bob's draft and think it very worthwhile for everyone to, to look for that in future. Uh, Professor Harrison has been just wonderful in terms of uh, her contribution to this program. John Ritter has participated in so many of our programs. We always appreciate his presence. 
and we uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Ritter. I am an architectural historian, and I have done a lot of work on this building uh, and presented some of that research here in this rotunda in the past. Uh, I've looked a lot at the history of the, the building, its architect, its development, and in particular the urban planning around the development of a kind of civic center that emerged in the early decades of the 20th century. Now today the story is not about my work or about this building, uh, but what we, uh, but really looking more internally here at, of course, the murals and the art programs. Um, I'd like to begin by also recognizing Norman Goodman, who uh, was very welcoming to me as a young scholar when I started to work on this project in the early 2000s. I remember sitting with him and with John uh, in the uh, conference room and uh, really being assured that I could have access to archives and records and a full tour of the building. And of course, uh, I was grateful to be able to uh, present some of my work again here in, in the building. So Norman, I remember, is very warm and, as John has said, supportive. Uh, custodian of this building uh, and so uh, certainly happy to participate today in, in helping to remember uh, Norman. Um, today our program is really about again the murals and putting them in their proper context of the history of how these uh, programs developed across the history of mural painting in America, other public commissions, courthouses and you're going to hear a great deal about that from my colleagues uh, Greta Berman and Helen Harrison in a moment. Uh, let me begin by telling a little bit just about the basics of the mural programs that you're uh, seeing here uh, in the rotunda that, that you uh, walked through as you came in the vestibule and the colonnade and of course there are other murals as well on the upper floors of the building. I, I direct uh, your attention also to the, the screens here which are displaying some photographs that were taken by John K. Werner, John Werner's son who's with us today. Uh, John K. has uh, uh, is displaying some photographs here of murals here uh, in the vestibule, the colonnade, the rotunda, but also upstairs in the um, different jury rooms. So again, those will be circulating throughout the uh, the program, and, and, and you could get some insights into some of these works. Uh, Greta and Helen will also be talking about them a little bit in their in their comments today. Uh, the building uh, itself. Uh, was conceived, first approved under uh, competition in 1913. And as soon as you may know, and we have the publication here of 60 Center Street, a look back, which has, a, on your chairs, has a great deal of information about the history of the building and the, the project. Uh, if you read through the historical article there, you'll come to learn that the original plan for this building was that it was to be a, an entirely round building located really in the center of what we call Foley Square today, at the site of what had once been the Collect Pond. And it was described at the time as a kind of Coliseum-like round building from which uh, jurisprudence or uh, courtly wisdom would sort of emanate out into the city in various ways. For various reasons, that building was changed into the hexagonal one that we occupy today. Uh, there were a number of delays in the construction from 1913 until the building finally opens in 1927. Of course, there was the intervention of World War I. There were political administrations that changed um, and a number of problems with the site. But um, well, I would say the artifact or the relic of that original round domed building is in fact the rotunda that we sit in today. That remained constant throughout the, uh, the original plan for the building and its uh, revisions. And so the idea of a painted uh, rotunda was something certainly that the architect Guy Lowell had in mind initially uh, from 1913 and then he preserved it through into the, the, the project that opens in 1927. It seems also, and, and I'm learning, I'm knowing a lot of this from the work of Bob Mead that, that, that John Werner described a moment ago, and I do um, uh, uh, confirm, uh, as John says, that this work will be published uh, forthcoming in the Journal of the uh, Historical Society of the New York Courts, also on their website, where you can also learn more about the, the mural programs and about the, the artist and the context of the times that, that produced these murals. Um, Seems that the art, the architect Lowell had already met and planned this. Uh, met the artist uh, Attilio Pustula in the teens or the twenties when they were working together on some country houses on Long Island. So it's likely that uh, Lowell had in mind that Pustula would design and, and execute these murals already when he was proposing the building in the teens. Um, there was no money when the 
building was, was built in the 20s to include the murals, and so the Pustula plans were really revived only in the 1930s when there became public funding under the New Deal arts programs to, uh, to adorn public buildings with, with murals like these. And Helen and Greta, who will follow me, will talk more about that process. Uh, but certainly, uh, the, 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 the cycle that we see here, law through the ages, as well as the cycles um, in the vestibule and the colonnade, were planned for the building from inception, although again, they're uh, executed a little bit later in, in the 1930s, after the opening of the building in 1927. Um, this cycle of the vestibule, colonnade, and, and uh, rotunda here were the first uh, public projects approved by the New Deal Arts Administrators for New York in 1933 and really 1934 is when the first approvals came through. And they were not only the first in New York, but probably the, certainly uh, most likely one of the largest mural programs in New York under the New Deal programs and possibly in the United States, one of the largest of the New Deal arts programs um, approved for public funding across the U.S., whether in courthouses, libraries, um, schools, or the like. Um, Again, I'd refer you to Bob Mead's forthcoming article for much more detail about the, um, the, the, the subjects, the, uh, the history, the, the painting techniques uh, of, of the murals that we're witnessing here. Again, Greta and, and Helen will also discuss these a little bit more today as well. Um, there are also, of course, as we're seeing on the screen here, a number of other mural cycles in upstairs courtrooms, jury assembly rooms, uh, which uh, Greta and, and Helen will also discuss a little bit more as well. Um, we know clearly a lot about this guy, Attilio Pustula, the, uh, the, the chief artist uh, on this program. We don't know so much about the others who worked on the program. Uh, there were likely as many as 30 assistants who worked on these murals here in the building, uh, but their names and identities are, are lost to history so far. Bob Mead has done an excellent job uh, resurrecting the archaeology uh, of the history of these buildings, but there's work still to be done to understand really exactly who were the people up on the scaffolding, you know, working on uh, the, these um, uh, the, these murals. And again, uh, Helen and Greta will have a little bit more to say about the identity of the artists who worked on, on the New Deal projects. Um, the final thing I would say is that relative to uh, this guy, Attilio Pustula, things that I learned from Bob Mead's work and research that might interest you as well, a very brief kind of biographical sketch. He was born in 1862, died in 1941. Again, we'll hear more about his work here on this, um, on this project later today. He was born in Italy, uh, trained and worked in and around Milan in the late 19th century, uh, participated in his career in Italy in a number of progressive and even, I might say, radical aesthetic and political social movements in Italy. Uh, first came to the U.S. probably in 1893 for the World's Columbian Exposition and then moved here probably full-time uh, after 1904 when he came to St. Louis to direct the Italian um, uh, section of the installation at the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. He had a number of large commissions across the U.S. and Canada in his career. Already in the teens and 20s, he worked on two mural cycles at the Canadian uh, Parliament buildings in Ottawa, uh, doing a number of cycles on political leadership, transportation, and commerce as themes. He had a, um, a uh, commission for the uh, Astoria Column in Portland, Oregon, unknown to me again until I read Bob Mead's article, a 130-foot high triumphal column that tells the story of kind of Western migration, Native American, and colonial settlement of the, uh, the Western provinces that come to become uh, Oregon. Uh, he also, Pustula, had a career in New York as a teacher and an inventor. He was active in the 1920s and 30s in something called the Leonardo da Vinci School, which uh, was a low fee and later free art school for immigrants um, operating here in lower Manhattan. Uh, so Pustula gave his time and expertise broadly to the field, not only on this project, which by including multiple assistants, you know, trained a generation of artists, but also here more broadly in the immigrant community. He was also an, an inventor. Uh, he, uh, like da Vinci, <laughs> uh, patented a flying machine. Again, I learned this from Bob Mead's article, which I refer you to. And he also uh, patented a number of amusement park rides, uh, sort of water palaces or water gardens, uh, which were installed or licensed by operators of amusement parks at our own Coney Island in Boston and Chicago, including at, at Coney Island, the Dreamland, and Hellgate ride, uh, which may or may not have contributed to the fire that destroyed Dreamland, but that's another story. In any case, uh, Pustula, a very interesting character who left, obviously, the legacy of these uh, representations for us here in, in these rooms. Um, okay, so with those brief introductions and my uh, referral of you to further reading, if you wish to know more about these in Bob Mead's forthcoming article, let me turn to my official duty here in, uh, in um, 
introducing our speakers. So we have two speakers who, who will share more with us about, again, not only these murals, but again, the larger context of these murals relative to the types of uh, themes, cycles, and subjects that courthouse murals typically uh, portrayed, as well as uh, a broader understanding of uh, New Deal mural painting here in New York City. So our first speaker is uh, Greta Berman. Uh, she unfortunately had uh, an accident recently and is not able to join us in person. So we'll be uh, seeing Greta's pre-recorded comments on these screens uh, momentarily. Let me introduce Greta. Greta is an art historian with nearly 50 years of teaching experience at the college level. She was professor in the liberal arts department at the Juilliard School in Manhattan from 1978 to 2024. Uh, Dr. Berman received her BA from Antioch College, her MA from the University of Stockholm, and her PhD from Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Berman has guest lectured, uh, guest curated and lectured a number of exhibitions, including at Lehman College, Rutgers University, McMaster uh, Museum of Art in Hamilton, Ontario, and among her uh, full-length book publications are uh, most uh, pertinent to this talk today. Uh, the Lost Years, Mural Painting in New York City under the Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Project, 1935 to 1943, which came from her doctoral dissertation. And then uh, Realism and Realities, The Other Side of American Painting, 1940 to 1960, co-authored with Jeffrey Wexler, and uh, Synesthesia, Art and Mind, co-edited with Carol Steen. Uh, Professor uh, Berman, again, is not able to be with us, so I direct you to join me in turning your attention to the screen. I will introduce our second speaker, Helen Harrison. Uh, after uh, Greta speaks, uh, I'll introduce Helen here in person. So uh, thank you for your attention. Hello, um, my name is Greta Berman. Uh, I am participating in this exciting event because I wrote my doctoral dissertation way back in the 1970s about the New Deal murals, the specifically WPA murals, um, which were done between 1935 and 1943. At that time, nobody was particularly interested in them. Uh, I had to kind of fight to get to do this dissertation, but a little by little, uh, they accepted it. And today, people look back at that period as being incredibly important. I want to share my screen with you and talk a little bit about these wonderful murals that are at 60 Center Street in the courthouse and kind of put them into context. My dissertation was uh, called actually The Lost Years because many of these murals were lost, uh, done between about 1935 and 1943. This mural that you're looking at here doesn't look anything like the beautiful Pusterla murals at the courthouse. However, this mural by Diego Rivera and many like it by Orozco and Siqueiros, the Mexican mural painters, were enormously influential for most of the WPA mural painters. And I'm going to talk about the murals at the courthouse in the context of many of the other murals that were painted at the time. Uh, this particular mural, some of you may know about, was destroyed actually shortly after um, Rivera painted it because Rockefeller objected to the inclusion of uh, Lenin that we see over here. And in fact, the whole mural being a kind of tribute to communism and against capitalism. Uh, but that's another whole story. The murals uh, that you're actually uh, able to witness right now are several, but the most gorgeous and phenomenal of them is this huge dome by Attilio Pusterla, done with several assistants. And its title, Law Through the Ages, uh, is one that was done in many different places in different ways. So when a mural was done in a courthouse, an appropriate subject is obviously the law. 
uh, when it was done in a hospital, the subject was often medicine. Uh, when done in an airport, and I will show you one of those, the subject was the history of flight. Uh, Pusterla was different from many of the other WPA artists. Most of them were young, struggling, just beginning their careers. Pusterla, I was actually amazed to read, was 72 years old at the time that he carried out this mural. He had been born in Italy and had an Italian formation and has a great deal of Italian influence in his work. Here you can see some details of this gorgeous dome mural entitled Law Through the Ages. And what you're seeing above on the left is the English King John and colonial Puritanic perhaps uh, Bradford, uh, who are showing aspects of the law. And on the right, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And along what goes behind them are sort of panoramas of history of different kinds and different times and different ages. Interestingly, a dome in Washington, D.C., in the D.C. Capitol, was done way before that uh, in the 1920s. It was called the Apotheosis of Washington. And it was done also by an Italian immigrant to America, Constantino Brumidi. And you can see the elegance of this dome. And here he shows, it's a little hard to see here, but George Washington elevated in a kind of apotheosis. Both of these, Brumidi, Pusterla, and the others, were influenced by particularly uh, Michelangelo and um, Andrea Montaigne. Here's Montaigne's very famous oculus in the Ducal Palace in Mantua, done during the Renaissance. 1465 to 1474. Now, this one was done in true fresco, and it shows a kind of trompe l'oeil, that is, to deceive the eye. So we look up at a fake uh, kind of ceiling. It is a, a dome shape, but it looks as if we're looking to the exterior, and figures are on either side. But what you can see that's kind of similar to Brumidi and to, of course, Pusterla, is this round shape with figures coming in different ways and coming off the, um, the ceiling. The uh, Montaigne was done in what's known as true fresco, uh, which is done in plaster and actually becomes part of the wall. The um, Pusterla was done in a fresco secco, which was not true fresco, but was painted on top of the plaster. Uh, this figure is part of uh, the kind of adjacent murals to that large um, dome. And he has many figures here. I was struck by this figure of learning, which represents some aspect of the law and its similarity to Michelangelo's uh, Sibyls and Prophets on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And of course, Pusterla was familiar with this. How could he not have been? In addition, there are some uh, murals that Pusterla and others did about literature and music. And these are again influenced by previous artists. You can see the classicizing influence. Uh, I thought particularly of Pouvie de Chavannes, who was a French symbolist painter towards the end of the 19th century. I show you here a kind of uh, uh, a little bit pale uh, version of something called dramatic poetry, just to show a kind of similarity to what Pusterla did with his seated classical figures and the others depicting literature, music, and in the case of uh, Pouvier de Chavannes, poetry. 
uh, Puvi also did murals in uh, Boston, in the Boston Public Library. So now I'm going to move to some other murals that are extant, that is, that they exist in New York City. One of them is by James Brooks, who later became a well-known abstract expressionist painter. He was a friend and neighbor of Jackson Pollock's in Long Island. He painted this in 1940. And this is what it looks like today, sorry. Um, it's in the uh, Marine Terminal at LaGuardia Airport which is uh, used now for several different flights um, going out of LaGuardia. At the time he painted it, this was a major airport and uh, it was uh, the planes that went to Europe and so on went through the ocean, they were marine planes. And here you can see he does the history of flight and he does this in a kind of similar way, or at least there's a uh, feeling that's akin to what Pusterla did in the courthouse, in that he shows something that's appropriate to the place that it's in. Here you can see one part of it where he invokes Greek mythological figures, much again as Pusterla did in invoking his history of Greek and Roman uh, predecessors. And here you see uh, the uh, Aeschylus and Daedalus, Daedalus flying and uh, uh, then the uh, fall uh, that he made by going too close uh, to the sun and uh, this whole uh, idea and kind of uh, early uh, ideas about flight. Here you see more modern ideas of flight and this huge man and woman that are making designs very much influenced by Diego Rivera, whom he had seen. Uh, by the way, this mural was not true fresco either, which turns out to be a good thing, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Um, Brooks, uh, whom I interviewed at the time, said that he, while these are somewhat realistic, he used this opportunity to do some experiments with abstract design. So he puts together abstraction and realism in a way that would be understandable to uh, common people taking a flight and looking at it. And here, I'm sorry, this uh, slide is not so great, but you can see Leonardo da Vinci, who was one of the people who invented flight and these various uh, designs, which actually look a little bit more like Alexander Calder, Miro, School of Paris, which influenced uh, James Brooks. And here you can see just a little bit later after he finished that mural, what Brooks did, these totally abstract compositions, but you can see the predecessor in those. Um, so uh, what happened with Brooks's mural was uh, sometime probably in the 1950s, the whole mural was covered over with kind of light blue paint. And for several decades, this mural was not able to be seen. We don't know exactly why it was covered over. There are various stories that uh, because the WPA was Franklin Roosevelt's project, that it was too left wing. And therefore in the 50s during the Cold War, they felt that they had two lefty or even communist tendencies. <laughs> There's nothing at all communist about this painting. Um, but there was no respect for it, that's for sure. And they simply covered over this gigantic mural uh, that goes around the whole rotunda of the airport and fortunately can be seen today. A similar but a little bit different story surrounds Harlem Hospital. 
Uh, this is what it looked like uh, a slide that was taken in 2012, but it pretty much looks like that now. Um, these, uh, this is a glass reproduction of the murals inside Harlem Hospital. So <clears throat> these were done for the nurses' residence and for an old building at Harlem Hospital. And when you came in the entrance to the nurses' residence, you would see these two adjoining murals by the um, painter Charles Alston uh, called Magic in Medicine and Modern Medicine. This again, although it doesn't look like the Pusterla mural at all, relates to it in the sense that he gives histories of medicine, just as Pusterla and others did histories of law. And what Austin does here is he counterposes the older idea of magic in medicine with what he called a conjure woman, a figure up here, animals, and sort of mysterious treatments that went back to tribal times. And he contrasts this huge kind of idol with a more modern scene of medicine where you have doctors and nurses and a gigantic telescope and also a Greek predecessor and Greek temple. Uh, interestingly, just a little sidebar, the nurse holding the baby here in the middle was not actually a nurse. She was Charles Alston's wife who was a surgeon. But he said nobody would have believed that a black woman could be a surgeon in those days. Here you can see the restored murals. They were in the old building. They were flaking off the walls. And uh, when I wrote my dissertation, I found photographs of them, went to see them. And uh, I will say was instrumental in the first restoration of them um, during the late 70s, early 80s. But now the building was knocked down and they've been reinstalled. And we see this group called The Pursuit of Happiness. It's the story of black people coming from Africa and making a turn here and coming to the United States. And here you can see this kind of turning uh, movement here with a black family coming from the South and you can see the remnants over there with a huge wheel of progress, which seems to be kind of symbolic of the times and they're looking towards the future. Uh, here, one of the things that African-Americans did in America, or two of the things, the church on the right and the nightclub on the left, which we think is probably Cab Calloway. And here, a detail of a preacher uh, in a uh, room. Here's one of the murals done by the youngest uh, person and woman, Georgette Seabrook, what it looked like when I first saw it. Here's what it looks like now. I'm sorry, it's small, but you can go see it in person. Now they celebrate these murals. They made collages and reproductions of them. But at the time, they were enormously controversial. The white superintendent of hospitals didn't want black people on the walls of his hospital. He felt that one day uh, it might not be African-American. Um, but luckily, he was overruled, and those murals are rightly celebrated today. They were very much influenced by a group of earlier murals by Aaron Douglas across the street in the Schomburg Library. These preceded the WPA, but you can see, uh, you can see them now uh, there if you go look at them. Uh, the story of the uh, recorded word by Edward Lanning is uh, presently still in the 42nd Street Library and reminds me a little bit more of, of Pristerla's history of the law. So what do we have but the history of the written word, Moses and the Ten Commandments. I believe Moses also appeared in Pristerla. And here we see a medieval scribe 
uh, Gutenberg showing proof to the elector of Mainz, uh, another uh, view of newspapers coming about, a boy reading in a lunette, very Italianate, um, mother and son, again Italianate, and interestingly, a ceiling showing Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. It doesn't look like Pusterla's, but it has the same kind of ring to me of a majestic celebration of, in one case, knowledge, actually in both, of knowledge, law, enlightenment. Another mural that was done at the time around 1938 was by Lucien Bloch, The History of Music, which was done for a music room in George Washington High School. That had some problems in that the uh, superintendent of schools or the, the uh, principal didn't like it. Uh, and this one's true fresco. It was painted over and then repainted. And here you can see some details of this. And uh, a mural done at the Library of Richmond Hill, which showed people moving to the suburbs from the slums of New York, again, influenced by the Mexicans and the um, Mexican mural movement. Here you see the poverty and the dirt that these uh, people, one is wiping a tear from his eyes, these poor children with their little um, brother, perhaps, and the elevated subway, and they moved to these beautiful suburbs. Lastly, I just wanted to show that there was a great deal of variety in the WPA. And there were actually a group of quite a few abstract murals. This one was by Stuart Davis, and it was done for station WNYC. And it's now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on long-term loan. Here you can see it um, uh, in better color, but here a better reproduction. And lastly, a mural by Stuart Davis that was done for the Williamsburg Housing Project, but never was installed. There were several that were installed, and those have been rescued and are now at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Uh, this particular one is, uh, was again rescued and is in the Art Museum at Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, and it shows a very abstract kind of landscape. Here's a, a better reproduction of it. I think perhaps the reason it was never installed, you can see it just knocks your eyes out and it's quite different. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to discuss the role of the murals at 60 Center Street in relation to other WPA murals. And I look forward to hearing the remarks from other people and to uh, seeing these beautiful murals again in person. Thank you for your attention. Our next speaker will continue, I think, to put these murals uh, into their context of time and place with a survey of some issues related to these murals, but also where they came from in terms of the history of courthouse commissions uh, across the 20th century. Uh, Helen Harrison is here with us in person. Uh, she is an art historian, curator, journalist, and author. She received her master's degree in art history from Case Western Reserve University with a thesis on social consciousness in New Deal murals. Uh, she's recently retired after a number of decades, I believe, as director of the Pollock Krasner House in, and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. Um, she is known for her books, essays, reviews, and exhibitions devoted to modern American art, and also for her fictional uh, Art of Murder series of historical mystery novels set in the New York art world. Uh, for 28 years, she also wrote reviews and feature articles for the New York Times Long Island edition. And she's been the visual arts commentator for the Long Island University's NPR affiliated radio station for many years as well. Her nonfiction books include Hampton's Bohemia, Two Centuries of Artists and Writers on the Beach, and uh, monographs on the artists Larry Rivers and Jackson Pollock. Uh, Helen and her husband, 
the painter Roy Nicholson, live in Sag Harbor, New York, and she's come in by Jitney to join us today. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in welcoming Helen to the podium. Thank you. First, I want to thank John for putting this together and his team here at 60 Center Street for giving me this opportunity. And where are we? Okay. The decoration of American courthouses with inspiring mural art goes back to the late 19th century during the boom in Renaissance revival and neoclassical architecture. Inspired by the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the so-called City Beautiful movement spurred the construction of civic centers around the country. Often anchoring vast urban redevelopment projects, the Beaux-Arts style court buildings were suitably embellished with paintings, sculptures, and furnishings designed to enhance the feeling of authority, stability, and permanence befitting such monuments. The commissioned artists were trained in Europe, often at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, and later at the American Academy in Rome, founded in 1894 by the architect Charles McKim. They also traveled to study old master examples in Europe's churches and palaces firsthand. Based on these precedents, they developed secular versions of liturgical and mythological imagery, heavy with allegory and symbolism, on themes such as civic virtue, justice, democracy, the history of civilization, and other such lofty abstractions. And I'm going to show you some examples of courthouse murals of that type, only a couple of miles north of here in the Appellate Division, First Judicial Department at 27 Madison Avenue. The building, designed by James Brown Lord, opened in 1900. So may I have the first slide, please? Yeah. There we go. Now I know you can't read all of this, so don't worry about that. Just look at the pretty pictures. This frieze by Kenya, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with these murals because they're right up the road. This frieze by Kenyon Cox, a prolific muralist whose work is also in the Library of Congress and several other civic buildings, gives you a sense of the standard attributes. Anchoring the composition, law is represented by a female figure holding the statute book, flanked by innocence holding a transparent globe and sheathed sword. On the left, a loosely draped figure representing mercy is in charge of an open cage from which two jailbirds have been released, while on the right, an armor-clad female warrior holds an oak branch symbolizing endurance. Wreathed emblems of the United States and England represent the legal system's heritage. Uh -oh. There we go. On the opposite wall, a trio of opulent murals by three of the era's renowned decorators go over the top in celebrating jurisprudence. The philosophical concepts are again allegorized by female figures in classical drapery, accompanied by symbolic attributes and characters representing the legal system's workings. One critic praised the Edward Simmons panel on the left by saying, law is represented by peace and prosperity. On one side, a powerfully modeled man representing brute force is making a move to assail peace, his upraised arm being caught and checked by the figure of fear. On the left, prosperity is giving, fruits, uh, giving of her fruits to a widow with a baby at her breast. Edwin Blashfield's panel on the right was hailed as, quote, the finest conception of modern justice, dignity, deliberation, force and unsentimental mercy, unquote, while Henry O. Walker's central panel was panned as, quote, a trifle colorless, a little inert in movement, and tangled in composition. Personally, it's my favorite. Four years later, for the circuit court in Baltimore, Blashfield painted Washington surrendering his commission, in which he combined figures of the general's contemporaries with symbolic ones. Unlike John Trumbull's 1824 version of the same scene in the U.S. Capitol, in which Washington hands his resignation to the Continental Congress, here he's laying it at the feet of a personified Columbia, 
seated on her throne with a sword, wearing a cuirass breastplate and a liberty cap. Opposite Washington is a female figure representing Maryland. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Behind her, the goddess of war is seen sheathing her sword, and resistance to oppression is breaking her rod, while prosperity bears a horn of plenty and commerce holds the caduceus. Seated near the throne is the figure of history. Officers and troops representing the military are in the left panel, and on the right is a magistrate and officers of the French and Revolutionary Armies. In the same building, however, Charles Yardley Turner painted a more naturalistic depiction of a historical event, Treaty of Calvert with the Indians. That's the one on the lower, lower section. The center panel depicts Leonard Calvert, Maryland's first colonial governor, negotiating with the Yaokomiko tribal leaders in 1634. The panel represents indigenous domestic life at the time, while the right panel shows an immigrant family settling in the colony. So while the sidebars, so to speak, are generic, they dispense with allegory and place people in their contemporary settings, which is a more modern way of telling the story. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Turner's naturalism notwithstanding, by the 1930s, the predominance of allegorical symbolism in American mural painting was prompting a backlash from progressives eager to break into the field, but frustrated by the retardataire attitude of the National Society of Mural Painters, which was dominated by the old guard. The aspiring mur muralist George Biddle summed up the sentiment, quote, a weak, thin-blooded, sugar-coated imitation of the French Beaux-Arts Prix de Rome, which in itself is the last vulgar, middle-class death agony of the pseudo-classicism of David, of helmets and urns and faces and white triumphal bulls and chariot wheels and little cutie girls with budding breasts and French Empire dresses. That was the dried-up tit that we painters were given to suck on. I guess he didn't like it. Ironically, it was the Great Depression that gave impetus to the new approach. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's election in 1932 and the advent of the New Deal following his inauguration in March 1933 provided the opportunity to reimagine the embellishment of public buildings. Looking south of the border for inspiration, as Greta mentioned, Biddle and his cohorts saw the Mexican mural movement of the 1920s as a model for a revitalized decorative tradition. A black sheep scion of the distinguished Philadelphia family who studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of, uh, and in Paris, Biddle wrote to FDR, his Groton school and Harvard classmate, posing a similar scheme for the United States. I know you can't read it all, but I'm just going to read the end of it. He said, I'm convinced that our mural art, with a little impetus, can soon result for the first time in our history in a vital national expression. Fortunately, this proposal came at a time when New Deal employment programs spurred a significant building boom, creating many blank walls that muralists could fill, including these. <clears throat> But even before the Federal Works Administration began erecting post offices, courthouses, and other federal buildings as part of the recovery effort, the Treasury Department initiated a pilot project that employed artists to decorate existing buildings, including the one we're in now, which opened in 1927. Known as the Public Works of Art Project, it operated for about six months in the bleak winter and spring of 1933-34. It was under that program that the Pusterla murals in the vestibule and colonnade were created. Given its short duration, the PWAP was remarkably successful and demonstrated the feasibility of government support. It employed more than 3,700 artists who created over 15,600 works of art and resulted in the establishment of two parallel programs, one for competitive commissions based on merit run by the Treasury Department, and the other administered by the Works Progress Administration for unemployment relief. And here's just a listing of the four principal projects. 
The Treasury section of painting and sculpture began in the fall of 1934 and operated essentially as a procurement agency, hiring artists to decorate new and existing federal buildings. Among the early Treasury section projects were major commissions for new buildings in Washington, D.C., including the Department of Justice. Begun under the Hoover administration, the building, designed by the Philadelphia firm of Zanziger, Bori, and Madari, was inaugurated in 1934, and several artists received commissions, prestigious assignments, for its extensive mural and sculptural embellishments. George Biddle's reward for setting the whole scheme in motion was the job of decorating the fifth floor stairwell. Like his friend Diego Rivera, Biddle chose to work in true fresco, painting into damp plaster directly on the walls. His program features grim scenes of modern injustice contrasted with naturalistic, if idealized, imagery of home and family incongruously dressed in city clothes in a farmhouse setting. In addition to his brother, Francis Biddle, who is the center at the, at the, at the center of the table in the farmhouse, Biddle portrayed some notable New Dealers, including Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins, the first female cabinet member, and the section administrator Edward Rowan, and the National Youth Administration's Camille Miller, as well as a self-portrait seated next to Perkins in the sweatshop scene. It's a little hard to see, but it's on the extreme left. In the same building, the prominent regionalist painter John Stuart Curry was commissioned to paint lunettes depicting westward migration and the triumph of justice over mob rule. Together with Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood, Curry, a Kansas native, was one of regionalism's so-called big three. His murals can also be found in the Kansas State Capitol and the University of Wisconsin's Law Library in Madison. It should be emphasized that all Treasury Section commissions required approval from various other authorities, which in this case included Washington, D.C.'s Fine Arts Commission and the Justice Department. There were two objections to Curry's design for the law lunette to which the artist obligingly responded. Under the judge's outstretched hand, a man brandishes a club. In the original sketch, it was simply a raised fist, but because that's the communist salute, Curry was asked to add the weapon. And after the mural was installed, Attorney General Homer S. Cummings requested a modification to the face of the central figure with the lynching rope. It was a gruesome death's head to which Curry discreetly covered with a red bandana. Due to their inherent narrative status, representational murals in prominent positions in public buildings have often been controversial, usually on the grounds of subject matter or imagery like this one, rather than artistic style or quality. Many have suffered from negative reinterpretation as the social and political winds have shifted. Representations of African Americans have been especially polarizing. Here in the rotunda at 60 Center Street, the panel depicting Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation, in which an anxious crowd of enslaved people eagerly await liberation, originally included at the lower right the figure of a smiling black boy holding a piece of watermelon, intended to inject, quote, a hint of levity to brighten up the solemn picture, end quote. But before the mural was completed, objections arose to what Pusterla evidently didn't realize was an, ex a, an offensive stereotype, and the artist immediately agreed to delete the figure and replace it with a portrait of the renowned abolitionist Frederick Douglass, which you see in the lower right. In Birmingham, Alabama, a pair of pre-New Deal courtroom murals by John Warner Norton, a prominent muralist from Lockport, Illinois, who worked primarily in Chicago, contrasts the genteel antebellum South with its dynamic modern counterpart, showing stereotypical white figures towering over scenes of manual labor, in which both black and white workers are subjugated. The sanitized version of sugar and cotton harvesting in the Old South panel is particularly offensive, and there has been a long-standing effort to have the paintings removed. 
Born in Russia and trained there, Simka Simovich, uh, Simkovich uh, sorry, immigrated to the United States in 1924 and settled in Greenwich, Connecticut. In 1936, he won the competition for a New Deal mural in the James Eastland Post Office and Courthouse in Jackson, Mississippi. Simkovich's composition shows what appeared to be enslaved people picking and weighing cotton, accompanied by a banjo player, with no indication that this is forced labor. According to the General Services Administration, which inventories the art in federal buildings, the workers are sharecroppers, but that's not the way viewers have interpreted it. While such imagery was entirely acceptable in the Jim Crow South, it became increasingly distressing in the wake of the 1960s civil rights movement when the first African-American judge appointed to the federal court in Mississippi ordered it to be covered with curtains. The building is now privately owned and I don't know the mural's current status. Also open to interpretation is Conrad Abrizio's mural in New Iberia, Louisiana. A native of New York City, Abrizio trained in France and Italy before moving to Baton Rouge in 1936 to teach at Louisiana State University. His painting has been criticized for its apparent depiction of darker skinned people hoarding money and gambling while being admonished by a lighter skinned man with more traditionally European features. According to the artist, the imagery illustrates the continual struggle waged by man to free himself from the forces and conditions which restrict his material, physical, and moral well-being, without reference to the generalized figure's presumed races. The symbolic meaning of the red-skinned man apparently sowing seeds on stony ground, which sends a rather negative message, was not explained. In response to community pressure, at one time curtains were installed to hide the painting on demand, but they were removed about 10 years ago, and the mural's fate is currently undetermined. Sometimes when buildings pass out of government ownership, the art in them is relocated. That was the case with murals by Jerry Bywaters and Alexander Hoag, originally installed in the Houston, Texas Parcel Post Building and now in the federal courthouse. Bywaters, born in Texas, and Hoag, who hailed from Missouri, were members of the so-called Dallas Nine, a group that focused on southwestern scenes and subjects. In 1934, the two artists also collaborated on murals, which are now lost for Dallas's old municipal building. Late examples of Treasury Section commissions, their six parcel post panels depict activities of the Houston Ship Channel. Judged by today's standards, the scenes are straightforward representations of labor, but during the 1950s, they were interpreted as subversive, and this may also have been the case with the mural at the uh, Marine Air Terminal by Jim Brooks. An article on the courthouse website explains, quote, Taken together, Hogue and Bywater's murals highlight the determination and dignity of everyday people who worked in Houston's shipping industry. Yet, sometime in the 1950s, the murals were removed from the Parcel Post building. The images, which had once represented the hope and determination of the American working class, became symbols of organized labor and socialism during the Cold War hysteria that swept through Houston during the 1950s and 1960s." End quote. The paintings, each by six by eight feet, were removed and stored in the basement, where they were found in 1976 and later moved to the federal courthouse. Although they contain no judicial subject matter, they celebrate the, inf the definitive aspects of the local economy that operates under the rule of law. This is true of many other modern courthouse murals as well, so even though the Houston paintings weren't intended for a court, they're not really out of place. Relocation from one courthouse to another happened to Emil Bistrom's panels for the Roswell, New Mexico Federal Building. Bistrom, a native of Hungary, came to the U.S. with his family when he was 11 and settled in New York City. He moved to Taos, New Mexico in 1930 and was a leader of the modernist art colony there. He studied mural painting with Rivera in Mexico and in 1936, painted the, Rothko mural, uh, the Roswell murals under the Treasury section's small and short-lived relief project, 
a hybrid endeavor funded by the WPA but run under Treasury guidelines. In other words, the artists had to have their work assigned by commission, usually awarded to a master artist like Bistrom, whose assistance came from the relief roles, working mostly in existing federal buildings. The TRAP only ran for three and a half years, during which time 89 murals were created. A local example, which I urge you very much to go down and see, and it's very nearby, is in the uh, Reginald, Re Reginald Marsh series of New York Harbor scenes in the rotunda of the former U.S. Custom House on Lower Broadway, which is now the National Museum of American Indians, New York City branch. When the Roswell building was slated for demolition, someone had the foresight to have the paintings removed and stored in the Albuquerque courthouse basement, where they were discovered and restored in 1983. The composition is a pastiche of vignettes contrasting right and wrong, with tablets representing the Ten Commandments, anchoring a rather belligerent interpretation of law enforcement with an unsheathed sword and a mighty arm symbolizing justice. I don't see much merciful tempering, but I do see a clenched fist that makes me wonder if the mural was originally removed because of its left-wing symbolism, rather than to save it from the wreckers' ball. In the same building is a mural by Lawrence Mosley, an Illinois native who also spent time in Taos and taught at the University of Texas in Austin. His Albuquerque mural is unusual in two respects. First, the artist worked for the WPA instead of the Treasury Section, or TRAP, which one would have expected in a federal building. How an artist on relief got the job would be an interesting topic for further research. Second, while it's not uncommon to find scenes of Native American skirmishes with white settlers, this depiction of the only successful Native uprising against a colonizing power in North America in which the Spanish were driven from New Mexico for 12 years and which helped ensure the survival of Pueblo cultural traditions and sovereignty is highly stylized. That is almost never the case with federal building murals for which the Treasury favored naturalistic treatment. How Mosley's abstracted design got approval is another question for further investigation. Yeah. A more, I, here we go. A more typically illustrative example of tribal versus settler conflict is a section of Ruth Monroe Auger's mural cycle in Enid, Oklahoma, which shows native horsemen attacking a wagon train. Born in Austin and raised in Denver, Auger studied art in New York City and Los Angeles. While women made up nearly half of all WPA federal art project employees, as far as I've been able to determine, this is the only New Deal courthouse mural by a female artist. This scene is part of a much larger program covering more than 1,000 square feet that comprises six so-called trails, picturing indigenous hunters, Spanish explorers, cattlemen, ranchers, and homesteaders. Originally commissioned by the PWAP in 1934, the same agency that commissioned the Posterla murals in the vestibule and colonnade, Auger spent over a year on research before beginning to paint one of the country's largest WPA mural projects. And I want to thank my friend and intrepid researcher, James Bauer, who's here with us today, for locating this singular example. Now, considering such imagery in contrast to the neoclassical Beaux-Arts tradition against which New Deal muralists were rebelling, one can see why some of the more modern subject matter has aged poorly. While you might expect timeless allegories like this blast field in Cleveland's federal district court to be beyond such shifts of public opinion. But you'd be wrong. Not only does Blashfield's grouping of lawgivers include an image of Muhammad, whose depiction is deeply offensive to most Muslims, but his use of the Ten Commandments, much more explicitly rendered than in Bistrom's Roswell mural, as the law's foundational principles violates the separation of church and state, a fact not lost on legal scholars and some members of the general public, especially in light of some very recent legislation in Louisiana. Not even the traditionalists are immune from prosecution. Speaking of traditionalists, let's look at the 60 Center Street murals more inclusively. 
I want to give special thanks to John Warner and Bob Mead, who have amassed extensive documentations on the building's entire mural program and the artists responsible, and the beautiful booklet that's been produced for this occasion. In addition to Pusterla's work in the vestibule and colonnade, and then in the rotunda, and on the seventh floor, as Greta has described, there are decorative devices by him in various corridors, but with one exception, the courtroom and jury room murals are by other WPA artists. Like Pusterla, Andrew Schwartz was a seasoned, classically trained muralist who worked on many projects, notably with Siddons Mowbray at the Morgan Library. How he came to be a WPA employee at age 68 is not known, but the project, and this is probably true of Persterla as well, the project did have a 5% quota of non-relief so-called master artists who trained and directed less experienced assistants. So he may have been hired on that basis. And of course he was Powell's chosen, uh, Lowell, excuse me, Lowell's chosen uh, muralist for this building, although he wasn't able to execute them when the building was, was first designed. Now, his murals in Ceremonial Court 300, which is what you see here, depict the transition from Dutch to English rule, that is, from New Amsterdam to New York in the 17th century. And on the opposite wall, behind the bench, the first assembly of New York, historical scenes that are rendered in a naturalistic and illustrative style reminiscent of N.C. Wyeth. In Jury Assembly Room 448, Robert Ryland painted a series of vignettes of early New York, including a map of New Amsterdam, what you see here, and scenes of city life. And I want to thank John K. Werner for this and other photographs in the Jury Assembly Rooms. Also in his 60s, with extensive mural experience, Ryland based his imagery on vintage prints. Each scene is identified with a painted plaque and, as in Schwartz's case, illustrates an aspect of the city's history. By contrast, the murals in the adjacent Norman Goodman Jury Assembly Room 452 depict realistic scenes of New York as it was in the 1930s, up to the minute when they were painted, but now nearly a century in the past. Pusterla's panorama of Lower Manhattan from the harbor with classic tugboat, the Staten Island Ferry, and the RMS Queen Mary steaming up the North River, bracketed by the Statue of Liberty and skyscrapers, is accompanied by uh, Schwartz's Brooklyn Bridge and Wall Street side panels. John Edwin Jackson's view of Midtown highlights the relatively new Chrysler and Empire State buildings while Winthrop Turnley's uh, survey of Riverside Drive shows Riverside Church, Grant's Tomb, and the George Washington Bridge. Jackson and Turney, in his early 50s, the youngest of the group, were both veteran muralists and also worked as illustrators. Other Manhattan landmarks are shown in flanking murals by Schwartz. They include the New York Public Library, the Atlas Statue at Rockefeller Center, Columbia University's Low Library, and the Woolworth and Municipal Buildings. Although the palette is naturally muted, they are in need of cleaning again. As you can see from the recent photos, some of the other murals could also use restoration. Like the buildings of which they are an integral part, murals require regular maintenance in order to sustain their artistic integrity. The steward, stewards of 60 Center Street's magnificent art and architectural legacy are to be commended for their ongoing efforts to preserve and interpret these outstanding examples of federally supported public art. And they will be passing the hat after this meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. Um, 
As you can see from our program, the, uh, we were planning to have a discussion uh, about some of the issues raised here among myself, Helen, and Greta, uh, given that Greta can't be here and that we're running over on time. Out of respect for your time and our time, we're going to dispense with the discussion. However, uh, I'm sure you have questions. I have questions. I'm going to invite you to us to continue this discussion informally over uh, a a reception uh, here in the rotunda to the to your right um, behind the platform uh, behind the screens there in a few moments uh, before we do that however if you can stand it we'll have uh, time for one more tribute I'm going to introduce Joan Levinson from the clerk's office who in turn will introduce uh, Deborah Kaplan so thanks for your attention and just a few more minutes thank you Good afternoon, everyone. I know we're running really late. I had a list of thank yous. I'm not going to go through them. I'm just going to say thank you to everyone who helped make this program possible. Judge Kaplan, our Deputy Chief Administrative Judge, truly regrets not being able to be here. There was a last minute change at the judicial seminars that required her to be presenting right now as we speak. But she did write a letter to John, and I am going to read the letter. Dear John, when you first wrote in December 2023 expressing an interest in presenting a program in the rotunda at 60 Center Street in remembrance of Norman Goodman, county clerk and commissioner of jurors for 45 years, I immediately expressed our interest in working on such a program with you. What you did not know, however, was the parallel planning going on behind the scenes. It was our intention that this event be a tribute to you as well. John, your invaluable contributions to the court system and to this particular court are myriad. Perhaps mo most noteworthy and relevant today's program is your love of history and art. Among many accomplishments, you were instrumental in organizing the dedication of a replica of the original 1927 bust of Guy Lowell, the architect of this iconic courthouse. You then w worked for months to have the Rosenberg exhibition displayed in our rotunda. And thereafter, you focused your energies on the Tombs Angel Project, the result of which was the restoration to public view of the tribute to Rebecca Salome Foster, who was called the Tombs Angel. Indeed, it was five years ago to the day that we held a rededication ceremony for the monument. When I spoke about you in 2019, I said that you were an inspiration to us all, and I could not wait to see what you would do with the next chapter of your life. I knew that your story was far from over. And so, a part of your story continues with today's outstanding event. To say that you were actively involved in creating this program is an understatement. It would not have come to fruition without you. Now I'm going to ask uh, Dennis Rayo and is Michelle Gonzieski here? Michelle, please come up. The plaque we present today hangs in a prominent place in this majestic courthouse so that everyone who comes through the doors of 60 Center Street, those who come here seeking relief that only we can provide, and those who work here ensuring equal access and equal justice to all, will know just how important you are to us. And the, 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 plaque, the plaque reads, in recognition of John F. Warner Esquire for 30 years of outstanding service to this court as Chief Clerk 7 and Executive Officer, and in honor of his dedication and passion to preserve the courthouse and to share its rich history. With gratitude, the Supreme Court New York County Civil Branch, the Historical Society of the New York Courts, June 25th, 2024. And, and now we have some honored guests who would like to say a few words about John. Judge Littman, do you want to come up, please? Uh, 
as the president of the Historical Society and one of John's predecessors with a much shorter longevity here than John, what could be better than to be here at the unveiling of this plaque on the day that we start the Norman Goodman lecture series here at 60 Center Street? You know, it's a great honor and a privilege to speak about my friend and colleague going back over 50 years. And it's hard to believe that that's the case. I remember getting here in late 71 or so. Uh, John was already here. Uh, his reputation as a brilliant lawyer very much uh, was the case at that point. Uh, he was even then so kind. I learned so much about the law and the ins and outs of this place, 60 Center Street. The law assistant pool that John and I were both a part of were at the heart of this institution. We had great judges. John and I used to joke, uh, each of them killers in their own right. We meant giants in their own right. Um, we had a spectacular staff from all parts of the city and beyond. John's career and mine were parallel in so many respects. In not too long a time, we were both part of a triumvirate here at 60 Center Street. I was the chief clerk and executive officer. John was the chief law assistant and then the chief clerk of the appellate term of the Supreme Court. And Norman was the county clerk. Um, and so fitting that this series is named after Norman. But we used to joke whether Norman as the county clerk or myself as the chief clerk was the real clerk of the court. And I ran the operations, but I knew who the real clerk of the court was, the keeper of the flame of the majestic 60 Center Street, and that was Norman. And I was so proud to work with him and to assist him. And when the time came that I left to become, I guess it was in the late 80s, to become the deputy chief administrator for the statewide court system, Norman and I both knew that was, uh, there was only one person who had the passion and the commitment and the concern for the people who worked and had their careers here at 60 Center Street and the lawyers who practiced here. And that one person was John F. Werner, and he was more than able to take up the battle with Norman as to who was the real clerk of the court. <laughs> to be sure, um, I felt quite guilty persuading John to become the chief clerk, and I did have to persuade him. You know, he was such a brilliant lawyer, and taking him away at that time, first as the uh, chief law assistant and then as the chief clerk of the appellate term, he was so much closer to the law, and it, it, I really was, was very guilty about it, going to a job where it was more administrative in nature. But my view, and I know Norman felt the same way, was that there were a few brilliant lawyers, of which Norman, of which John was way at the top, but there was no one with the humanity, the sheer goodness, and love for 60 Center Street, the building and its people, there was no one like John in that regard. Everyone loved him, and in return, he loved them back. He treated them as family, and 60 Center Street as the family home. As the years went by, and I went on to be the presiding justice of the appellate division, and then to be the chief judge. I had so many things happening in my own 
professional and personal life, but what I knew was one thing, and that was that the jewel of the New York State court system, the most distinguished trial court in the United States of America, where the greatest lawyers in this country came to practice, was in the very best of hands with John F. Werner. John Werner <clears throat> John Werner was on the case 24 hours a day along with our buddy Norman Goodman. He was essential. John was absolutely essential in preserving and, and, and protecting the history and greatness of 60 Center Street. He, in so many ways, epitomizes what 60 Center Street was all about. And I could say the same thing about the Norman. They're both from the same cloth. Uh, but John would sit up there. Norman was on this level, and John was in the clerk's office, you know, uh, up there. Uh, and he was standing at that desk. He didn't sit when he worked. He stood when he worked. I remember when he salvaged that desk from the garbage somewhere downstairs or outside the court. I don't know where he got it exactly. But he stood at that desk when he worked, holding court. Everyone came to see him, and everyone got their day in court. So as the president of the Historical Society, and as his lifelong friend and colleague, John, we, I, all of us here, thank you. This plaque is just the smallest token of our esteem and our appreciation for your life, lifetime commitment to this place, to this building that we all love. This is such a critical part of New York City, and John has been just a critical part of all of our lives and of this particular, again, gem at the heart of our city. Um, he loves this place, and we all love him, and it's a delight to be here today with all of you to celebrate John with this wonderful plaque that we, it should be here and will be here forever. So thank you all. John, if you're wondering how so many of your family members made it to the courthouse on this very specific day, you have your brother to thank for that, who would also like to share a few words. Richard. Obviously, John is high regarded. I'm his brother, two, two and a half years older. And I'm here to tell a true story. Uh, I've, I've known him since his, his cur cur curious birth, um, and till, till today. So I'm in a good, I'm in a, a good, good place to uh, observe him. My following comments may give you further insights to John. Are shared with great respect to him. I do have other comments that I can share in private if anyone is interested. John has really not changed since early childhood. We both attended PS6 in Manhattan, uh, and we walked to school set with our father. We, we walked home separately, I normally getting into trouble, J John normally bringing home things from the sidewalk, money, paintings, everything else that, that, that he, he could collect. Uh, this led our father to say that he always had his head down when he walked. To, to this day, John continues to collect and prizes items from Manhattan streets, some valuable, some not. As recently as, as last year, he captured the, the painting 
a print of some obscure artist, and he's still searching who, who painted it. it. He has a, pho a pho photographic memory, and once engaged, he likes to share this information with a listener or, or listeners, to the point that he would say, I have talked too much, haven't I? After a, a quick breath, he would, he would continue on to tell the story that he was telling. This recall ability enabled him to, to become a, a for, for, formidable debater in college and, and high school. His, his tendency to capture and never discard anything continues today. He still stores our parents' 1968 maroon Cadillac in his garage. I was going to discard an old canoe. He came up to me and said, can I have that canoe? I said, of course. He, he, he took, uh, he, he, he repaired it a little bit, put on some oars, and now it's his most prized possession. Um, he, he, uh, that with, a, with, with, all, with his 10 other boats, mostly landlocked, uh, are, uh, starting with a star in 1958. So he is a real collector by every sense of the, the, the thing. I would be remiss in not mentioning John's family. Uh, he met Laura Alice Meyer when he was a, a sophomore at, at Trinity School, and she was attended attending Friends Seminary one year behind. They clicked immediately. Their eventual marriage was a, was a per perfect match. They both became successful lawyers and had many of the of the, uh, of the same interests. They raised three wonderful children, two of them lawyers, surprisingly, Jeffrey and Margaret, and an entrepreneur with many interests, including working with charitable organizations, startups, venture capitalists, and so forth. This tribute to, to John is a surprise to him. It was very difficult to, with, with him knowing so much about everything, to, to, to keep it a surprise. Uh, and. It, but we had to do that because we knew that if he knew about it, he would not be here today. He, he somehow would uh, uh, avoid it. Uh, there is one thing that bothers me about John. We occasionally disagree on something, and it turns out that he is always right. <laughs> uh, in closing, I would like to thank Allison, Maury, and Marilyn Marcus for helping to get this thing together. And I thank this tribute to John within the, tri the tribute to that, that, that we have here today for everyone is well, well deserved. <laughs> Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> well, I've done the work, you didn't know. Have John, did you want to say just a few words here? Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, no, I know it's late. I don't want to keep it, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, I want to thank Joan Levinson for her beautiful remarks, and of course, uh, Judge Kaplan for uh, her, her, her beautiful letter. I mean, of course, uh, I had the privilege of working with Judge Kaplan when she was administrative judge of this court before she went on to become administrative judge for all of the city of courts, and, and that, was, that was just wonderful. Of course, uh, Jonathan Lipman had this remarkable career in the court system. Everyone is so proud of him. Uh, we started together in the law department of this court as court attorneys, law assistants, and uh, uh, it's been so wonderful to follow uh, John's outstanding career in the court system, and uh, he continues to do so much, both in terms of uh, public service initiatives and uh, and private uh, initiatives. Uh, he uh, uh, is, is close to everyone's heart here at 60 Center Street, having grown up at 60 Center Street. And so we claim him, and, uh, and uh, he's done us proud. Uh, I need to thank, of course, the Historical Society of the New York Courts. Uh, it is such an important organization. Uh, our courts are under attack from all quarters today. Uh, sometimes of their own making, but it's something that we have to be mindful of. Uh, when these beautiful murals were painted, it was in the midst of the Great Depression, 
poverty and disaster everywhere. Uh, fascism was expanding unrelentingly across Europe of the 1930s. And so the artists who painted these beautiful murals, even serene murals, did that at a time of great chaos, great strife, and World War II barreling down upon us. Uh, today is a challenging time, too. And uh, it is uh, the rule of law. Uh, it is our courts. Uh, it is our democracy that uh, will uh, ensure that we come through all of the difficulties that we are facing here today and that we find all over the world. And so uh, it's been a great privilege and pleasure to uh, be a part of this court for so many years. I haven't said anything about my family. I'm, I don't even want to mention that they're here. Nobody tells me anything. I had no idea. And I can't imagine how they got here. Uh, they certainly didn't come with me. So, uh, but uh, of course, I love them all. And, uh, and I'm so proud of all that they are doing as well. So uh, thanks to everyone in the court, Judge Silvera, Michelle Gonzieski, the seventh floor team, uh, the Goodman family. Norman was dear to our heart always, continues to be. He's much missed. And uh, he was the real clerk of this court, no question about it. And we all knew it. And we all loved him for it. All right, well, thanks so much. I didn't mean to keep you.